Fish Tales from the Belly of the Whale, 50 of the Greatest Misconceptions Ever Blamed on the Bible. Chapter 12 Misconception number 43 Only humans get into heaven. Sorry, no pets allowed. Ask any Christian if they think their pets are going to heaven, and 9 out of 10 of them will probably tell you the same thing. Gee, I guess not, because the Bible says you've got to have faith to get in. I mean, sure, God created the animals, but that doesn't prove they'll get into heaven. That's reserved for people who have a personal relationship with Him, right? How can animals know God the same way humans can? Admittedly, on the surface, all this sounds quite logical. Or at least it does as long as you're content with an oversimplified view of biblical reality. But beware, you might be falling short of what the whole book of God says about who gets into heaven. How about you? Are you really so sure this issue is that cut and dry? And could the Bible be that vague about such a vast portion of his creation? Let's take a moment then to search the scriptures for any clues towards solving this mystery. The first chapter of Genesis depicts a world in which God first created the animals and then mankind. And when he'd finished, the Lord found that everything he'd created was good. What's more, the scriptures reveal that God created the animals out of the very same material from which he created Adam. To confirm this, let's re-examine some familiar biblical territory. The Lord said, It isn't good that man should be alone, so I'll make companions for him. And out of the ground God formed every beast in the field, along with every fowl of the air, and he brought them before Adam to see what he'd called them. And whatever Adam decided to call them, that was to be their name. Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 19. So, what's this word used for the ground from which the animals were created? The word in the Hebrew just happens to be Adama, which, according to Strong's exhaustive concordance, comes from the root word Adam, meaning ground. How ironic is that? The biblical word for the material God used to create these companions for humanity is actually a derivative of the word for Adam himself. Could this be why scientists were able to discover a link between the biology of the human and animal kingdoms so essential in their ongoing search for cures to disease? And could this connection between human and animal genetics explain why the theory of evolution is so irresistible to the scientific community? Also noteworthy about this verse is the way it states, in no uncertain terms, that God specifically created animals as companions for humanity not as slaves, as tradition so often insists, and certainly not as food. So much for the notion then that it's the Bible that insists that God views humanity as being inherently superior to the animal kingdom. To the contrary, when God said everything he created was good in his sight, he meant everything. What a shame that most people simply accept the idea that God only created animals to be tools for the sake of his greater creation of humanity. How arrogant are those who choose to hunt and peck at scripture, ignoring anything that doesn't support their lopsided interpretation of what they'd like the scriptures to say. But such is the power of the three laws of disinformation, latch, isolate, and repeat. And to think how many centuries have rolled by that continue to distort the fallen aspect of the Adamic portion of creation in a way that denigrates the rest of the non-Adamic portion, which God himself saw as being good. Now this certainly doesn't mean that the animal kingdom hasn't suffered because of God cursing Adam and his descendants. Any biblical scholar would readily admit that the Apostle Paul was speaking the truth when he said that both the animal and human kingdoms are linked in relation to the fall of Adam. Speaking to this point, in the book of Romans, Paul wrote, Every living creature waits expectantly for the manifestation of the children of God, seeing as how even the animals were made subject to pride not willingly, but because of him who subjected them in hope, because every creature will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of God's family. Until then, we see how the entire creation groans and agonizes in pain together, and not only them, but we too, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we who yearn within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, that is, for the redemption of our bodies. Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 23. So, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the scriptures are clear. God created the animal and human kingdoms out of the very same material, and he created them in a purposefully united way. 
To believe otherwise would be to buy into the kind of faulty thinking that only people who are themselves avid proponents of disinformation would gladly believe and embrace. Not only that, but based on this way of thinking, we'd also have to dismiss what the Bible says about some rather unique encounters between animals and people. In this case, I'm not talking about tall tales of scripture that are to be seen as fish tales, but instead, the kind that are meant to astonish and amaze, and in doing so, persuade us to believe and embrace the miraculous. Case in point, in Genesis, Eve encountered a talking serpent, but oddly enough, she never even acted startled. Without batting an eye, she just carried on a conversation with the creature as if nothing unusual at all was happening. Now, the serpent was the cleverest animal that God had created, and he said to the woman, Did God really say you shouldn't eat from any of the trees in the garden? And the woman replied, We can eat from any tree in the garden. God only told us to not eat from the tree at its center. That's the one he told us to avoid, because if we so much as touch it, we'll die. Ah, you won't die, cooed the serpent. It's just that God knows if you eat from that tree, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be just like God, knowing good and evil. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Likewise, in the book of Numbers we read, And when Balaam struck his donkey, the creature looked back at Balaam and asked, What did I ever do to deserve that? And Balaam replied, You mocked me, and if I had a sword in my hand, I'd kill you here and now. Dumbfounded, the donkey blurted, Who, me? But aren't I your donkey, the one you've ridden ever since you got me? Have I ever done anything like that to you before? And Balaam said, Never. Numbers chapter 22, verses 28 through 30. How bizarre is that? And when I say bizarre, I'm sure most of you think I'm asking, how bizarre is that for someone to have a conversation with a donkey or a serpent? But no, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm asking is, how bizarre is that for someone to so casually respond to a talking animal? No doubt, talking to an animal is bizarre, I grant you. But considering that the Bible is a book full of miracles, the idea of a talking animal is certainly no harder to believe in than the parting of the Red Sea, or Jesus walking on water, or any other number of miraculous events. No, what I find so bizarre is the casual way that Eve and Balaam respond to these talking animals as if they were carrying on a conversation with another human being. Still, I can imagine many people hearing this who are thinking, ridiculous. No wonder we don't look to the Old Testament anymore for truly inspired wisdom. You can't really expect us to take stock in old wives' tales like that anymore, can you? To which I'd reply, well, okay. Ever heard of the book of Revelation? You believe in it. It's in the New Testament, right? Of course, you'd say. I believe it. Why do you ask? Well, let's see. Turn, please, to the opening chapters of Revelation, where the Apostle John is taken up to heaven to the very throne of God. Notice how there are what are described as four beasts, sometimes called four living creatures, in the presence of the Lord Almighty. And these so-called creatures are said to resemble a lion, a bull, a man, and an eagle, respectively. And I saw near the throne of God there were four beasts, and in the midst of the twenty-four elders there stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God that have been sent forth throughout the entire world. Revelation chapter 4, verse 7. Almost every Bible-believing Christian is familiar with these four living creatures, but how many have ever stopped to consider how much talking they did in God's presence? And when I saw that the Lamb had opened one of the seals, I heard, like the sound of thunder, one of the four creatures saying, Come and see, and look, a white horse. And when he'd opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see, and there went out another horse that was red. And when the Lamb had opened the third seal, I heard the third creature say, Come and see, and look, a black horse. And when he'd opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And then I saw a pale horse. Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. So, not only does the Bible depict these four creatures as talking, but it also reveals that they're the driving force behind one of the most pivotal events in biblical history. And mind you, this event is so famous, many unbelievers are familiar with it. The announcement of the four horsemen of the apocalypse onto the world stage. 
Still, some of you might be saying, but wait, we're not talking about real animals here, are we? Doesn't the Bible say these are angels who only resemble the various animals described by John? To which I'd respond with a proviso and a follow-up. First, my proviso, which comes in the form of a series of questions. If there really is such a huge difference between animals and angels, then why would there be any relationship between these two distinct species in heaven? Is it because there really is a genuine connection between the two? And could this be why one of the angels among these living creatures is described as looking not like a lion, not like a bull, not like an eagle, but like a man? As for my follow-up, I'd like to add that in Revelation there's another pivotal event involving animals. This scene, however, doesn't involve angels who simply resemble animals. It involves the genuine article, though John does describe them as doing some pretty non-animalistic things. Not only that, but like the four horsemen of the apocalypse, this is one of the most famous events ever described in the Bible. Yet the fact that it involves real animals apparently does nothing to persuade the typical believer that, if they do consider themselves Bible believers, they should believe the truth of this scene too. I saw heaven opened, and look, there was a white horse. He who rode upon it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His name is the Word of God, and the armies of heaven that follow him are all upon white horses, clothed with fine linen, white and pure. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 14. Now admittedly, these white horses that Jesus and the returning saints are riding on are unlike typical horses flying through the air. Still, they are described not as angels who happen to look like horses, but actual flesh and blood horses. To this fact, some of the greatest works of Christian art magnificently attest. So, the next time someone tells you animals form an inferior substrata in God's creation, you can explain to them that they too have fallen victim to a subtle form of disinformation. Next time, you'll know what to say to someone who tells you that because there are no animals in heaven, you can forget about seeing your beloved pets there when you arrive. And if anyone asks you why so many people believe these marvelous creatures that God made were devalued in the first place, you can tell them. Don't blame the Bible. Blame the ones who've eagerly listened to the latch, isolate, and repeat crowd for so many centuries. What's more, anyone who wishes to see what the Bible says on this subject can turn to the 12th chapter of the book of Exodus. That's where they'll see how, at the first Passover feast, God promised to spare the firstborn of not only every male child in Israel, but all their male animals too. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me every firstborn male, because the first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. Then Moses said to the people, Commemorate this day that you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand. And when any of your sons ask you in the days to come, what is this? You tell him, we were delivered from Egypt, from the house of bondage by the strong hand of the Lord. As it so happened, when Pharaoh didn't want to let us go, that the Lord killed all the firstborn in Egypt, of both man and beast. That's why we sacrifice to the Lord every male creature that opens the matrix of the womb, and why all our firstborn sons are redeemed. Exodus chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, and verses 14 through 15. The real significance of all this lies in the fact that, as any biblical scholar will tell you, God intended this Passover event involving the slaying of a lamb to typify the death of Christ, who was himself the true lamb of God. On that night, any family who trusted God by smearing the blood of the Paschal lamb on the doorposts of their homes was spared the death of their firstborn males, both humans and animals. Just imagine then, if the blood of the Passover lamb accomplished so great a salvation, how much more effective is the shed blood of God's Son in providing a ransom for the families who place their trust in Christ Jesus? So again, when anyone tries to tell you that God's Word says humans are more important than animals, tell them not to blame the Bible. Blame it on those misguided ones who insist on reducing Scripture to their own puny image. Blame it on those ways of thinking that forever minimize God's true view of things. Instead of viewing animals as being inferior to mankind, 
realize that the scriptures can never be used to condone the slaughter of the animal kingdom, as if we were given free license over animals because of some inherent superiority we possess. Realize too that this subjection of the animal kingdom is just a temporary detour. That's because it didn't happen because of any crime the animals committed, to echo the words of Paul, but, quote, because of human pride, end quote. But thank God, quote, by reason of him who subjected us in hope, every creature will be delivered from the bondage of corruption, end quote. In pointing to this connection between the destiny of humans and animals, Paul was making a critical point. The plight of the animal kingdom is actually a mirror of truth that speaks of our own tragic existence, glaring proof of the fallen nature of humans as but one species amidst the marred creation. Therefore, we should always remember to gaze deeply into this mirror and to look honestly at our true selves. As fellow travelers in a vast universe that groans together for the release of God's curse, we should never forget that our fate is inescapably linked to that of our animal counterparts. And therefore, we should always strive to treat them as an extension of ourselves, even as God has ordained to treat us as an extension of Himself. Till then, we should keep in mind we're to do this not for our sakes alone, but for the sake of Jesus, who sacrificed His own life to reconcile to Himself all creatures, great and small. And above all, we're to remember that only through the blood of the Lamb are we granted entrance into that most sacred place where each heart hopes to be reunited with every loved one we've ever known and lost be they of our human or animal family.